This presentation content has been created by Eclipse Security LLC for Microsoft Corporation. For any questions or comments, please email inquiries at eclipsesecuritylc.com. The Cross-Site Scripting Vulnerabilities Level 200 presentation introduces the role that the Microsoft Security Development Lifecycle fulfills in trusted application development. It also provides an overview of one of the most common web-based vulnerabilities encountered today called cross-site scripting, as well as a discussion on how the Microsoft SDL can be applied to reduce the exposure to attacks based on the exploitation of this vulnerability. Addressing this subject matter will enable our organization to enhance our application development practices and the security of our applications. In this presentation, we will complete an overview of the Microsoft SDL, cross-site scripting vulnerabilities, and how exposure to attacks based on this particular type of vulnerability can be reduced through successfully employing the Microsoft SDL. The Microsoft SDL is a holistic and comprehensive approach that leverages education, process, technology, and executive commitment to consistently create more secure software internally within and external of Microsoft. Since 2004, all internal Microsoft developers have been required to adhere to the SDL, and Microsoft has updated the SDL every six months to address any emerging threats since its inception. True to its name, the SDL was created to complement rather than disrupt the software development lifecycle. The core phases and principles of the SDL include the training phase, the requirements phase, the design phase, the implementation phase, the verification phase, the release phase, and finally the response phase. In the training phase, every Microsoft developer must complete mandatory security training focusing on secure application development practices. Training sessions include topics such as threat modeling, secure development and testing practices, and security for application development managers. In the requirement phase, requirements for security and privacy must accompany functional requirements of the software that's being created. Such requirements may include the use of encryption, authentication, and other security measures based on the business requirements, exposure, and sensitive data. To that end, a security and privacy risk analysis is performed at this stage. In addition, the threshold for security and privacy, or bug bar, is defined during this phase to ensure that bugs with certain severity are addressed and resolved before the software is officially released. For the design phase, eradicating coding bugs with security implications is not sufficient. Design vulnerabilities can have a substantial detrimental impact on security and are much more difficult to address during the verification phase. To that end, threat modeling is a critical SDL requirement and a Microsoft security innovation that is recognized by analysts as the next evolution in creating more secure software. Through threat modeling, architects and developers at Microsoft are able to approach security in a structured and methodical way from an attacker's perspective. This allows Microsoft to identify and reduce attack surface and mitigate the risk of potential security design issues. The implementation phase is the application code development phase where code is written by developers using industry best practices and analyzed with both internal and external tools such as static code analyzers and special security debuggers to help ensure that those best practices are being followed. Requirements are also specified by the SDL in this phase to ensure that applications are built using the latest compiler versions and built-in compiler protection features. The verification phase is the quality assurance phase within which rigorous security testing is conducted in addition to typical functional testing procedures. In the release phase, the final security review is the major milestone that a Microsoft product team must pass in order to release a product under the SDL. During this meeting, security experts and the development team review all of the activities mitigations, and security artifacts that are relevant to the project in order to ensure that the security quality requirements are satisfied. During this phase, the product team defines a response plan describing procedures, accountabilities, and contact information 
in case security vulnerabilities are discovered after the product is optional, operational and used by the customers. In the response phase, after an application is released, the Microsoft Security Response Center, or MSRC, handles any security issues that are uncovered in the weld and mobilizes product teams within Microsoft to provide timely fixes for security issues. In summary, secure software development requires executive commitment, ongoing process improvement, education and training from VPs to product managers to developers to testers, tools to aid in detecting security vulnerabilities, and incentives and consequences to ensure everyone adheres to the SDL process. As was previously indicated, this presentation focuses on cross-site scripting vulnerabilities and how the exposure to attacks based on these vulnerabilities can be reduced using the guidance, process, and tools provided by the Microsoft SDL. Cross-site scripting vulnerabilities, or XSS for short, occur whenever an application reads user data and embeds that data in web responses without encoding or validating that data. The user data may have originated from an untrusted source, such as a malicious user or an untrusted database, and may contain malicious code or script. Client web browsers, such as Internet Explorer, Firefox, and Safari, will read these web responses and execute any embedded code or script. As far as the web browser can tell, the data contained in those web responses originated entirely from the responding web server, and all code and script is executed using the established trust level with that web server. Cross-site scripting gives malicious users the ability to perform nefarious actions against client web browsers, such as stealing session data and modifying the appearance of loaded websites. Some common vulnerabilities in web-based applications that make cross-site scripting attacks possible include improper validation of input, not encoding web responses, and trusting data read from shared resources. Encoding will be discussed later in this presentation, but briefly, encoding is a way in which developers can transform potentially executable code or script into non-executable code or script. Lastly, the insights gleaned by Microsoft, which are incorporated in its SDL, and more specifically in this presentation focusing on cross-site scripting, are being shared with each of you as a way for our organization to enhance our application development practices and the security of our applications. Here are some news stories regarding cross-site scripting. In October 2005, MySpace users were attacked with a cross-site scripting based worm that infected over a million users within several hours. In 2007, cross-site scripting vulnerabilities were reported by the Open Web Application Security Project, or OWASP, as the most common web application vulnerability. As companies continue to increase reliance on the web for business enablement, the frequency of cross-site scripting attacks in the coming years is expected to grow. On June 26, 2008, Secure Computing Magazine reported that a cross-site scripting vulnerability in Yahoo Mail could allow a malicious user to steal users' Yahoo credentials. Two types of cross-site scripting vulnerabilities exist. Both result in malicious code or script being executed on the client-side browser. However, they differ in the method in which that malicious code or script is delivered to the client. The first type of cross-site scripting is called Type 1 or Non-Persistent Cross-Site Scripting. You may often hear this type of cross-site scripting referred to as Reflected Cross-Site Scripting. With non-persistent cross-site scripting, malicious code or script is embedded in a web request and then partially or entirely echoed or reflected by the web server without encoding or validation in the web response. The malicious code or script is then executed in the client's web browser which could lead to several negative outcomes such as the theft of session data and accessing sensitive data within cookies. In order for this type of cross-site scripting to be successful, a malicious user must coerce a user into clicking a link that triggers the non-persistent cross-site scripting attack. This is usually done through an email that encourages the user to click on a provided malicious link or to visit a website that is fraught with malicious links. The second type of cross-site scripting is called Type 2 or Persistent Cross-Site Scripting. This type of cross-site scripting is often referred to as Stored Cross-Site Scripting. Persistent cross-site scripting is the more dangerous of the two types of cross-site scripting. With this variant, malicious code or script is stored in a persistent data store, such as a database, 
via a vulnerable web application. Examples include, but are not limited to, discussion forums, guestbooks, and any other platform where one user can share information with many others. Any user visiting this vulnerable web-based application is automatically sent the stored malicious code or script and is subsequently compromised. This variant of cross-site scripting has the potential to compromise many users via a single attack. This is quite different from type 1 cross-site scripting where one attack can result in a maximum of a single compromise. In the following slides, each of these types of cross-site scripting attacks and the attack scenarios they exercise will be discussed in more detail. Please note that some resources may reference a third type of cross-site scripting called Type 0 or DOM-based cross-site scripting. DOM stands for Document Object Model, and with this type of attack, a malicious user is specifically targeting client-side script. The malicious code or script delivery methodology for this type of cross-site scripting is very similar to Type 1 cross-site scripting, and therefore Type 0 is included with Type 1 in this discussion. Let's first take a look at a Type 1 cross-site scripting attack, or sometimes referred to as a reflective cross-site scripting attack. In this first scenario, we have a malicious user, a user who will be attacked, and a cross-site scripting vulnerable web-based application which the malicious user will use to attack the user. Here, the malicious user crafts a malicious email that is sent to the user. Contained in the email is a message that indicates that the user has won a prize and that in order to claim that prize, the user needs to click on the provided link. Unknown to the user, the link contains some malicious code that will be reflected back from the web server and executed on the user's web browser. The unsuspecting user clicks on the link and a web request containing the malicious code is sent to the web server. The web server takes the malicious code set by the malicious user and embeds it or reflects it somewhere in the resulting web response without encoding or validation. The user's browser reads the response and executes a code which then compromises the user in some way. After the attack is completed, the reflected malicious code does not stay resident on the web server. This is why this type of cross-site scripting attack is called non-persistent cross-site scripting. During the attack, you may have noticed that the user had to first be coerced into clicking the suspect link. Due to this required user interaction for this attack to succeed, many development teams disregard this type of attack claiming that users would not do that. The reality, however, is there is a demonstrated and ever-growing trend of unsuspecting users clicking on malicious links presented to them. This is reinforced by the fact that spam messages continue to be so prolific today. Links like these may raise the suspicion of more tech-savvy and security-aware individuals like developers and security professionals. However, for everyone else, links like these probably would not raise suspicion and more than likely be clicked. This is how Type 1 non-persistent cross-site scripting attacks work. In the next slide, you will see how Type 2 persistent cross-site scripting attacks work. The final variant of cross-site scripting attacks is Type 2 persistent cross-site scripting, or sometimes referred to as stored or second-order cross-site scripting attacks. This version of cross-site scripting is the most dangerous of all types of cross-site scripting attacks because unlike Type 1, Type 2 cross-site scripting attacks do not require user interaction in order to trigger the delivery of malicious code. In this scenario, we have a malicious user, a web server that hosts a web-based application that is susceptible to persistent cross-site scripting attacks, and a database that is used by the web application to store information such as usernames, blog comments, and other user-provided data. The malicious user injects malicious code or script into a vulnerable input field such as a blog comment and submits a page request. The web application then stores the blog comment into the backend database. Now, any user that visits the website, accesses the web-based application, and attempts to view the blog comments will cause the web-based application to retrieve the stored malicious code as part of the web response to the user.
The user's web browser reads the response along with the malicious code and is compromised. Any other user who tries to access this web-based application in a similar fashion is also automatically compromised. Persistent cross-site scripting attacks are particularly dangerous because they have the potential with one attack to compromise many users. This is in contrast to the previous cross-site scripting variant that is type 1, where one attack corresponds to one user. Furthermore, this attack did not rely on users being coerced into clicking some malicious link. As a final note about both types of cross-site scripting before moving on to a demonstration, since the injected malicious code or script appears to originate from the vulnerable web-based application from the client's web browser's perspective, that malicious code or script will have access to any session data set by that web-based application, such as potentially sensitive data stored in cookies. Now it's time to take a look at some actual cross-site scripting vulnerabilities and see how a malicious user can exploit these vulnerabilities for malicious purposes. In the coming demonstration, we will be taking on the role of a malicious user and attacking a demonstration website called the Contoso Credit Union. Please note that several security controls that are automatically enabled on Microsoft platforms had to be disabled for this demonstration. However, the goal of the demonstration is to visualize the potential for damage when those security controls and best practices are not used or are disabled. In this demonstration, we will be taking on the role of a malicious user and will be attacking a website called the Contoso Credit Union using cross-site scripting vulnerabilities. Specifically, we will be attacking the users of the Contoso Credit Union as cross-site scripting attacks are client-centric attacks. Both persistent and non-persistent cross-site scripting will be demonstrated. Before we begin, it is important to note that several automatically enabled ASP.NET controls designed to protect applications from cross-site scripting attacks have been disabled for the purposes of this exercise. Here is a Contoso Credit Union web page, which is a fictitious financial institution where users have the ability to create accounts, transfer money, and access other services. Let's first focus on non-persistent cross-site scripting. As with all cross-site scripting attacks, a malicious user needs to find an area within a web-based application where the application reads input and echoes back that input without encoding or validation. On the Contoso Credit Union main page, you'll notice the search box in the bottom right hand corner. Note that the search term Kevin was echoed back in the response page. Also note that the term that was entered into the search box was passed to this page by the query string parameter called term. Now we have found a vector where the web application reads input from the user, malicious or otherwise, and echoes back that data in the web response. Please note that cross-site scripting can occur through other input vectors and does not necessarily have to be through a query string parameter. For the purposes of this demonstration, query string parameters were chosen for easier visualization. Let's modify that query string parameter by adding h1 tags and see what happens. Our search term is again echoed back in the web response, but this time it is rendered using the h1 tags. This is a clear indication that this web-based application is not encoding or validating inputs before embedding them in web responses. So now that you have found a cross-site scripting vector, what can you as a malicious user do with this? Since you can control the code or script that gets executed by the client web browser, you can also control the elements of that page. A popular attack that malicious users like to conduct is to temporarily change the content of a web page, or sometimes called defacing a web page. Imagine the damage that could be inflicted on the Contoso Credit Union's reputation if a user visited the Contoso Credit Union page and there was clear indication that it had been compromised. Users would lose faith in the credit union's ability to protect their assets and move their business elsewhere, 
Let's now see how we can simulate something like this with our newly found cross-site scripting vector. The goal is to replace the Contoso Credit Union logo with something else and trick visiting users into believing that the Contoso Credit Union has been compromised. The image that you will use will reside on a different website controlled by you, the malicious user. Let's now visit that malicious site. Using cross-site scripting, you will use this image in place of the Contoso Credit Union logo on the main page. The script that was injected into the term parameter simply indicated to the web browser to set the source of the first image, the Contoso Credit Union logo, to load from the malicious user website. To complete the attack, all which is left to do is to convince the user to click on our modified link via an email or some other social engineering means. Note that this modification can only be seen if you visit the web-based application using the modified URL. Visiting the web-based application through regular means restores the logo image to the correct image, which is why non-persistent cross-site scripting attacks have the additional requirement of persuading users to click on specific links. The next and final attack demonstrates persistent cross-site scripting. For persistent cross-site scripting, a malicious user needs to find a vector within a web application where 1. The data entered by the malicious user is stored in some persistent data store, such as the database, and two, the stored malicious data is included in web responses without being encoded or validated. Here we see that the Contoso Credit Union is having a fictitious sweepstakes where users submit their name, email address, and a description of what they would do with $1 million. Each month, a winner is selected based on the responses received. After clicking the submit button, you will see that your entry is saved and shown here on the right hand side of the window. The next step is to determine if any part of the data that was entered is echoed back without first being validated or encoded. You can test this using the same approach that was used to discover the non-persistent cross-site scripting vector. Here you will wrap H1 tags around the description of how you would use the prize money and see if it gets echoed back in large font format. Notice that after you press the submit button, the entry on the right hand side of the page displays testing for SSS in large font. This means that the data provided in the description text box gets echoed back in web responses without encoding or validation. We have now found a persistent cross-site scripting vector. As a malicious user, one way you could guarantee that you would win the sweepstakes is to prevent anyone else from entering. To do this, you could inject JavaScript code 
that redirects any user trying to enter the contest away from the sweepstakes page and back to the Contoso Union main page. Effectively, you will be blocking any other entry but yours from entering the sweepstakes. After you press submit, the malicious script gets saved in the backend database, and now anyone attempting to enter the sweepstakes page will be redirected away. This is because our malicious JavaScript is being included in each web response for this page. Since you're the only entrant, you're guaranteed to win. Notice that with persistent cross-site scripting, you do not have to persuade a user to click on a link. All that is required for the malicious code or script to be triggered is for a user to simply access the affected web-based application. This is why persistent cross-site scripting is considered the more dangerous of the two types of cross-site scripting. Notice here that how every attempt to access the sweepstakes page causes the web browser to be redirected back to the main Contoso Union page. Several myths about cross-site scripting vulnerabilities exist. Here are two of the most common ones. The first common myth is that cross-site scripting applies to only web-based applications built on Microsoft technologies, such as ASP, ASP.NET, or that are hosted on Microsoft Internet Information Server. Cross-site scripting is a client-side attack that targets the web browsers being used to access the web application. Any web browser that reads HTML, JavaScript, or any other web-based language is susceptible to cross-site scripting. The second common myth regarding cross-site scripting is that attacks of this nature can be remedied through the use of transport security protocols such as SSL or IPsec. This is a myth because cross-site scripting is an application-level attack that is not affected in any way by the underlying transport method. There are several measures you can take as a developer to reduce the exposure to cross-site scripting attacks conducted through your web-based applications. The first defensive measure, which can be applied to address a majority of application security vulnerabilities, is input validation. Validating input is a key design, development, and test tenet of the SDL and should be used to ensure that all untrusted inputs into web-based applications conform to the expected input formats. Check for correctness with format, length, type, and range. Example sources of untrusted input include, but are not limited to, are data from users, data from a database, or data from an untrusted web service. The second defensive measure is to encode any web response data that may contain user input or other untrusted input. Encoding will be discussed in more detail later in this presentation, but briefly, encoding in the context of cross-site scripting attacks work by taking data that may contain executable code or script and transforming or neutralizing it into non-executable forms. Web-based applications built using Microsoft ASP.NET can leverage built-in protection via the Validate Request option. This option, when set to true, instructs ASP.NET to inspect all inputs into a web-based application for potentially dangerous inputs. If any potentially dangerous inputs are detected, then an HTTP request validation exception is thrown and the attack is halted. This feature can be enabled on a per-page basis or globally through the web.config file settings. It is important to point out that this feature provides only limited protection and should be used in conjunction with safe development practices such as input validation and output encoding. The remaining defensive measures are relevant to specific web-based applications and browser scenarios.
However, it is still important to be aware of these. In ASP.NET web-based application scenarios, where access to cookie data needs to be protected from client-side attacks, the system.web.httpcookie.http only property may be used. When set to true, this option limits any access to cookie data via client-side scripts. Please note that this option will protect against any client-side access attempts to cookie data, but does not provide protection for the cookie data in transport. For this scenario, use SSL or another transport security protocol in addition to the HTTP only option. The next defensive measure that will be discussed in this presentation are the frame and iframe tag security attributes. For users using Internet Explorer 6 and higher, web-based application developers can make use of the frame and iframe security attributes to limit embedded content within frames and iframes from executing potentially malicious scripts. The final defensive measure that can be used to help protect applications from cross-site scripting attacks is the Microsoft Anti-Cross-Site Scripting Library. This library provides additional encoding capabilities not provided by the standard encoding libraries included in the .NET framework. In the previous slides, encoding was highlighted as one of the key defensive measures developers can use to reduce exposure to cross-site scripting attacks. The idea behind encoding works as follows. To reduce the risk from cross-site scripting attacks, developers need to transform or neutralize user input that may contain potentially executable code or script into non-executable forms. That is, the web browser needs to be told in some way that the following data is not ex executable code and should be treated as data only. The way this transformation or neutralization is achieved is through encoding. Developers building web-based applications can use the following encoding libraries to help reduce risk from cross-site scripting attacks. The .NET framework has built-in encoding libraries under the class system.web.http utility. The encoding methods in this class work by looking for specific characters that are common in cross-site scripting attacks and encode them into non-executable forms. The Microsoft Anti-Cross-Site Scripting Library takes a different approach by first defining a set of valid characters and then encoding any character that is not in the valid set. Both are effective in reducing exposure to a majority of cross-site scripting attacks. However, they differ in the method in which they reduce the exposure. Let's see an example of code where untrusted data is being read from the user and then echoed back in a web response without encoding. As you will see, encoding data bound for web responses is easy using the built-in .NET and ASP.NET encoding libraries. In the code you see here, a query string parameter called phone number is being read. That read value is used to set the text property of a label control called phone number label. If that value contains any executable malicious code or script, then the web response will also contain that executable malicious code or script and the recipient will be compromised. As a developer, you can easily remedy this vulnerability by encoding the phone number value before using it to set the phone number label control text property. Here you see two examples of encoding, one with a standard encoding library included in the .NET framework, and the second that is commented out with the newer Microsoft Anti-Cross-Site Scripting Library. When you are encoding untrusted data, be sure to encode that data just as it is about to be written to the web responses. Also, be sure not to encode data more than once, as this may interfere with the functionality of your web-based application. Finally, be cautious of any data that you are decoding since it may return untrusted data back to into an executable state. Let's see a demonstration of how encoding and other ASP.NET security controls could have been used to easily reduce the exposure to the cross-site scripting attacks demonstrated earlier. As seen in the previous slides, protecting web-based applications and users against cross-site scripting attacks require that developers utilize a series of defensive measures and best practices. Furthermore, relying on just a single defensive measure alone may not be sufficient. In this coming demonstration, you will see how the Contoso Credit Union code could have been modified to use cross-site scripting attack defensive measures such as encoding and the ASP.NET's validate request option.
In this demonstration, you will see how encoding and the ASP.NET validate request option can be used to reduce exposure to most cross-site scripting attacks on the Contoso Credit Union site. You will be fixing the code implementation exploited in the previous demonstration. This is the file that contains the implementation for the search page that was exploited using a non-persistent cross-site scripting attack. The page underscore load method calls the set term label underscore no encoding method, which sets the text property for, of the term label to whatever was specified by the query string parameter named term. The term parameter contains the contents of the search field text box and was the vector that was used during the non-persistent cross-site scripting attack demonstration. As you can see in the set term label underscore no encoding method, Encoding was not used, which was why the non-persistent cross-site scripting attack was successful. To use encoding, all that a developer needs to do is encode the untrusted data specified in the term parameter by selecting the correct encoding method in the HTTP utility class. Encoding should be done just prior to embedding untrusted data as part of the web response. Since the value inside the term query string parameter is written back in an HTML context, then HTML encode should be used. The method setTermLabel underscore use encoding shows how to implement this. All that is required now is to change the page underscore load method to call the method that uses encoding and to comment out the one that does not. After encoding has been implemented, the non-persistent attack described in the previous demonstration should no longer work. In addition to the web response encoding, you can also use the ASP.NET validate request option to detect and reduce the exposure to certain cross-site scripting attacks. As a side note, this option is enabled by default and was disabled for the purposes of this demonstration. This option works by inspecting inputs into a web-based application for known attack patterns associated with cross-site scripting, and throws an exception if a known pattern is encountered. It can be enabled globally through the ASP.NET web.config file, or on a per-page basis. Let's enable this option through the web.config file first, and see the effect that it has on the previous cross-site scripting attacks. After the validate request setting has been set to true, both the non-persistent and persistent cross-site scripting attacks described in the previous demonstration should no longer work. Any attempts to do so will result in ASP.NET halting the attack and loading a custom error page. Let's try our original non-persistent cross-site scripting attack and see what happens. And as you can see, ASP.NET detected the attack attempt and threw an exception and halted the attack. What about the persistent cross-site scripting attack? Let's see if the ASP.NET validate request option is able to detect this attack and stop it. 
And as you can see again, the ASP.NET validate request option has detected the attack and halted it. Finally, the validate request option can also be enabled on a per page basis. To do this, developers simply need to set the validate request property in an ASP.NET web page directive to true. Let's see how you can do this with the million dollar sweepstakes web page that was attacked in the persistent cross-site scripting demonstration. This is the implementation file used for the sweepstakes page. Now, any of the cross-site scripting attacks described in the previous demonstration against the sweepstakes page will now be caught by the ASP.NET validate request option and halted. Please note that validate request only provides limited protection against a known set of cross-site scripting attacks. There may be instances where this option is ineffective and therefore developers should layer the security control with others such as input validation. In addition to safer coding practices to reduce the exposure to cross-site scripting attacks, you should also be regularly reviewing your code for this type of vulnerability. Any section of web-based application code that entirely or partially echoes untrusted data in web responses is suspect for cross-site scripting. Microsoft has published a code scanning tool called XSS Detect, which integrates with Visual Studio to assist developers and testers in this endeavor. It should be noted that this tool is designed to assist in code review and is not designed to replace or obviate the overall code review process. This tool is effective in identifying only certain coding patterns that can lead to cross-site scripting vulnerabilities and nothing else. This tool should be combined with expert manual code reviews and other security verification practices. This concludes the discussion on cross-site scripting vulnerabilities. Cross-site scripting vulnerabilities are the most frequently encountered web-based vulnerabilities today and have been found on several major websites. These vulnerabilities manifest in web-based applications whenever best practices such as input validation and web output encoding are not implemented in code. To reduce exposure to these attacks, developers should implement a multi-layer defense strategy that includes coding best practices such as input validation, web output encoding, and leveraging built-in platform protection. Microsoft has better enabled developers to do so through the guidance, process, and tools of the Microsoft SDL. Lastly, the insights gleaned by Microsoft, which are incorporated in its SDL, and more specifically in this presentation, which focused on cross-site scripting, have been shared with each of you as a way for our organization to enhance our application development practices and the security of our applications. This presentation content has been created by Eclipse Security LLC for Microsoft Corporation. For any questions or comments, please email inquiries at eclipsesecurityllc.com.